So, anybody has an idea why we want to use multiple six alignments? So we can define functional domains in control of regions to be frequency using that, which is actually one of the major features of multiple sequencing. Yeah. So we can extract much more information. I mean, there are several issues. But one is that, of course, I mean, pairwise alignment doesn't say so much. It's just um, happens with a random mutation. I mean, it might have some information, but if you really see have more, more sequences, you can expect much more information. So you really can see exactly what is conserved or not. I mean, if something is conserved through many, many sequences, that has most likely a functional reason. So in one position, there is, I mean, because mutations occur randomly. So, I mean, so, so, you would, so basically, you would expect from a mutation perspective that a particular residue will be concerned. But for a functional residue, so you would expect if that is a very important residue, it's a product that you decide it's doing something. If it doesn't taste it, the function enzyme doesn't work. And then if it's important enzyme, the, the ordinary dies. So that, that, that's, that's the way to localize it. So that's one reason. That's the problem. Yeah? And another reason is to find the evolutionary information like using codon models or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's. Um, I mean, also of course you can you can do it by comparing. Maybe you can compare different things. You can look at different parts of different different um, uh, organs. But no, I mean, actually, this block space, block space was almost obtained from multiple six lines. They were probably done manually in this days, but anyway, it was multiple six lines. So that you could use that. Uh, this is I mean, there, I guess there are two other reasons so, that are kind of related. I don't know what. So one is. So we'll talk about tomorrow. So, so we read the schedule to figure out what it is. Called phylogeny. So evolution. So basically, how are organisms or how are genes relate to each other? So basically, we have many classical question was of course, man, who is the closest ancestor to, to, to humans? And, uh, and many other evolutionary questions that are uh, are important. So that, that, that is a uh, so finding this, so for that you need the multiple six alignment, you need to have this comparison of all the sequences. And then actually the third reason is something you will do lab, is actually because by using multiple six alignments, you can actually find more homologs. You, you can make a bigger multiple six alignment, you can find remotely related sequences. Because you use the power, you use basically the focus of the area to the conserve, and ignore that, you know this, you use this information, and you can use that to find better homology. Actually, get better alignment and, get, and uh, make better three D models, whatever. There's a lot of information about that. So, there, so, this, so, this, so it's really an important part of also biomass. So nowadays, many many methods use one way of multiple sequence alignment or another. It's uh, uh, well, I guess it's some 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 that don't, but the principle is also a fundamental part of all sequence comparison. So that, that's the motivation, and, and so that's, uh, my, that's the reason why I want to do it. And the second part is at least to have an idea of my, how to do it, and my, you don't have to learn algorithm all the way through, because there are actually lots of details that are kind of uh, my, are extremely important, but they are kind of ad hoc, so they, they really, people have to have optimized them, so they're not fundamentally Algorithmic is so interesting because they're very much practical. And uh, also, a little bit how they are used, particularly for searching for uh, remote homologs. I mean, we have other areas like phylogeny and uh, machine learning and secondary structure, and other areas we used that we'll discuss later this week. But today we'll discuss about how we use them for finding more remote homologs. So, okay, I'm trying to go through the slides a bit quickly. So, when I talk about patterns, profile, and this alignment, it's like, it's a focus on not so much on how to make the alignments, but actually how they're used. But the, the patterns, so pattern is, is, is something that is just a description of a feature that you can extract from, from a sequence. Like it could be 
uh, an active site or something else. And it was, but it's a very binary description of it. Uh, profile is basically uh, something that was a PSSM, something that describes the probability of each amino acid in a, in a multisynthesis lime. How, how frequent are they? And the multisynthesis lime is basically what you start from. And then, so the first thing you can learn is basically that there are, in principle, I mean, you, you, could, you can describe a multisynthesis alignment exactly. You can describe what is the optimal alignment in the same way as we have uh, a power of alignment. So in principle, you could use some sort of dynamic programming. The only problem is that it's basically is 2 to the power of m, which is the nth number of sequences, minus 1. Alignment is for solving. Because you need to basically sort enough to align the one sequence to the to two that are all aligned. You need to align all three in combination. So it explodes very, very fast if you have more than a handful of sequences. So even to really find the optimal solution is computationally impossible for anything more than maybe five or ten sequences or ten things. Uh, so there are a number of methods. Cluster W, T coffee, K line that are doing this in a much more unique way that are computational and feasible. What, what can we mention today is what we did most of these methods were developed for the time when we had maybe a few hundred sequences in the family. But today there are cases where we have hundreds of thousands. So that many of these methods are not really able to handle that big families. So it is a method called cluster omega, which is pretty good at handling big sequences. Cluster Omega, so you can think of Cluster W. I think it was Cluster X and then Cluster W, and now it's Cluster Omega. That, 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 I'm not sure it's really, or it's the same author, or partly at least. But, but, but it's basically, it's, mm, I think it's maybe KLI also can handle very big families, but Cluster W and T coffee can't really handle it. And what happens when you, don't, when you can't handle it, either they're just in conversation too long, you don't get an answer, we have alignments that are extremely uh, unconnected, so there are lots, thousands and thousands of gaps in them. Side blast, which, is, which we talked through here a lot, is a very important method. It uh, was for a long time, until quite recently, probably the best method to use for searching sequences. Uh, it's not really a formally multiple sequence alignment method because it's, it really actually only adds sequences to a starting sequence. It has one sequence and it just adds more and more sequences. It, it doesn't really, never really change the initial sequence. It just adds things to it. So it doesn't, so it doesn't treat all the, all the sequences equally. You have, you have a fair sequence and they add things to it. But it, on the other hand, it actually that's pretty good because it, it, it works quite well. You don't, you don't avoid some of the horrible problems you get in other alignments by getting too many gaps. So we will go through how that works also. So that's some my idea you basically if you, you need to decide if you do this how you score things. You want to score things. Well, so this is the same substitution scores as we have in the parent alignment. And normally you want to score basically all substitutions. So you want to have used the C method here on here. So you want to score A, A substitution B and B with C and C with D, etc. So to add up the scores. But you can think about other rules you could fit have a center as you like it before. Or you have some tree that you only want to score things that are close to, that are most closely related to each other. But normally you treat all these things equally, and then you have to do it like uh, in C method. Yeah. So most most methods use some type of trick of uh, like this. So you basically first to do a pairwise comparison of all sequences. So that, that is just. Right. Doing normal uh, Smith Waltman and Lima Wolf's alignment, you do pair of alignments. <coughs> and then you try to align them, start with the closest pair, you like this, and then you take the second closest pair, and you align these, and then you try to align single sequence to multiple sequences. So, what we need to do is to do something like uh, you see here in the C here. So here, you want to align these two sequences to the, to the third sequence. But these are all aligned. So when you do this, you're not going to change the alignment between these two. You're going to keep it the same. 
Så i den fall så dit, och det kanske blir bättre att jag skår helt på att jag skulle vilja skåra så skulle jag bara dappa, dappa och dappa. Ja, så så det är här en allting här typ av en mer eller lysning här. Du kan väl skåra en lysning för allting för lysning för typ av. Ja, men för 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 So if you want to ask, assuming that the, you know, they have the, in the yellow you have a, a lighting, and the other one you have a 2% and you have another one. So then the score, the score is a substitution of a losing to a 2% plus the score of a losing to an another And you write that you come out. So that's the that, simplest way to do it. Or if you have more sequences, you just have more. Yeah, exactly how that is done, and how it's done in different ways, to people are very pleased with that, that's the simplest way to think about it. And as long as you don't have gaps, it's really easy. When you divide by two, it would be correct. Ah, right, because you want to have a score. You want to score to the same range. Uh -huh. And otherwise, if you have, and particularly maybe you have a gap among them, then you have to have the same, same score range as before. And because you have two scores out together. And of course, if you have basically, you can equally well do it. You also have, as I say, that you have an alley here also. You have two sequences here, two sequences here. You can have the score in something like score is and equal to alanine tryptophan plus uh, alanine alanine plus leucine tryptophan plus leucine alanine. And the score is equal to this. And why not? In principle, it's simple. And, and, and the reason why it's simple is because you, you, you keep it alive and fixed. But this is also, of course, a uh, limitation. If you happen to align this first, means that if you have an error there or something, then when you get to something else, you're stuck with it. So it, it, it actually matters in which order you start aligning things. Because if you were to find the yellow blow, you might have, and then when the other went to it later, You would have, I guess, you could have get another lineup. And this is why you, you won't find, you're not get, guaranteed to find open alignment. And you can keep on doing that. But in this case, it's not too hard. I don't mean that they have to try to get there and not to try sequences. So this is exactly what this class of W is doing. And this is a paper that made it almost 30 years old. But this method is still quite well used. So, when it, once you have this alignment here, it is standard dynamic programming, exactly the same as used before. It's not, nothing, nothing different. But you have problems with gaps. So, you said that if you have these four seekers aligned, you would align one more here. I mean, it's obvious that the two patterns will somehow end up here. But is this a gap opening, or is this a gap extension cost? Depends on which seekers you can't count with. How do you do, deal with that? And maybe if you would have like, uh, I mean, and in the beginning of the gap or end of the gap, maybe you would have like, like maybe actually this one should not be, should be aligned here and this one, so maybe, you could, maybe this E should be there. You can think about many things that should be, uh, that you are, once you know this one, maybe you want to, all the gaps start the same way, you want to move, move this one here all after itself. It would be better if you, you, you can think about, that adding new sequence around gaps for the problems. So finding something that you sometimes is that you actually adopt it, see if you have very, very gaps. So if you had if you had a duplication here, you have another gap here, or the made it to be there as well. So, so you have a tendency that if you get too many sequences just that it's just contain gaps sometimes. But what Castle W is trying to do here is trying to use what you call a uh, trying to get the gaps in the same area. So basically, if you have a multi sequence alignment in order to have gaps, it lowers the cost of the gap. Well, in this case, I can open the panel in this particular. So, but this is an ad hoc rule that is somehow optimized. So you see, and of course, that somehow makes the alignments have gaps in them that are clustered together, which is probably what you want.
So, 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 so of course, all the other maps use similar ideas, but just, just things that speed up things and things that they work different. But yeah, it's just to understand all the problems of it. The other point what, what you can uh, obtain about it. And it, it, it used to be said that basically, if you look at the good line, it looks nice. You can see it. I'm not sure it's always true, because you can always have a line that really uh, looks horrible, but they actually contain a lot of information. But, uh, and this what you can see here is that this aligns here three clearly three different groups. This group here is quite similar to each other. And this group here is sort of similar, and this one is maybe similar to that one, but it's actually maybe something here a bit different. So this one has a lot of positions that have the same amino acid conserved. And here they are and here it is really the group that are K here, but this one does not have a K and so that, yeah, it is still. And you can measure things like how conserved positions are. I don't have quality matches and all that, but there is, and, and uh, the consensus is that yeah, these are higher here than they are here. So you, you, can, you, you can sum up by looking at the alignment, see if it's good or not, but it's not, given today that have tens of thousands of sequences, it's not that easy. Some small alignments might be, they might be see. So for a long time, most actually that people, people, like people maybe still do, is actually do manual alignment, look at them, call them. I give it gigantic data that that's right. It's really, at least I can do it. Uh, and I said, this is what we'll talk about much more next, or later this week, is I think extra extract of information from it. So for instance, if you see these regions with all the gaps, do you know what that can represent? I said on the top of the slide. So gaps in the sequences, from the sequence, occur in loop regions. It's even more difficult to set a root gap in the helix, because you basically have to shift along the less with one position, but in the loops it is to accumulate the gaps. And that doesn't mean that it only occurs there, but there are more than that. So you would assume that these regions here are some kind of loop regions. So that's actually what we do. Talk about, I think, on Friday or Thursday, uh, where we discuss secondary structure prediction. And the same thing if you have patterns like this, you can assume that it's a, a term, so you have, for instance, conserved prolong here, I would like it, but they are these type terms. And there are a few other reasons why you have a single conserved prolong in the because that's, they're not part of secondary structures and they're part, hardly part of them, not part of the active sites. So this is some kind of type term. Is a way to type up. And you can have other patterns. You can have like a beta heat pattern. So you have hydrophobic polar, hydrophobic polar, hydrophobic polar, as you next to each other. That could indicate this is a beta sheet. That's what the surface of those is. And uh, you can see uh, if you see just a bunch of hydrophobic ones, that's probably a beta sheet that is in the middle of the process, that is barred. And you have these patterns where every third four has to use that are hydrophobic polar, that's probably the helix. So there, there are patterns you can do that. And of course, if you are an expert, you can extract this information by looking at it. But in general, I would say computers are much better than that than we are. So that's what we use for we let computers learn these patterns. It's an excellent thing for computers to do. But the information is there. And there was for a short while where people really could do better. Computers don't think that's true any longer. And if you look at, uh, for instance, conserved systems, or if you have a type of system that's conserved, another one, that can indicate that it's got a part of bond. And, um, yeah. And, I mean, if you find a conserved history, that's of an active site, the system is of an active site, active site et cetera. So they are, they are, and the other information can be done. And of course, to extract this information, you only want to look at it, you need to color it in different ways. You can color by polarity or by some other indexes, like probably to be in heat sheet or a helix, etc. So, almost normally, if you open a multiple alignment, there are a bunch of ways to color it, you just click on it.
Often the Commonwealth Congress is next to the conservation, so you highlight the conservation, so here you see the conservation are highlighted. Well, they are important as well, so yeah. Okay, we got this idea, but we'll have, we'll have a look at them on six slides. I mean, the key thing is like that if you really want to know something about proteins, it has a lot of information. But a lot of this is probably better than computer extracted from the neural. You're not going to look at the amount of things that I'm going to break the secondary structure yourself. Because I'm unless you're really, really an expert. But you might have to look at it to extract uh, active site residues and so on. If you have something indicated that. But uh, it's extremely useful as an input to various machine learning methods, completely different things. Get it? So, yes? What is the PSS? Position specific scoring matrix. So that basically. Uh, If we want to do an alignment, so instead of making it, if you have a sequence alignment, is like we have a matrix here we normally have, and if you have your clear sequence here, but you have your sequence you want to search here, instead of having say the sequence here, so but instead of having only one sequence, you actually have maybe. Multiple things alignment. So, what you do is you, that you can turn this alignment into a, what is called the PSM. You have uh, basically a position specific score matrix. You have a different score for every position in this matrix. That means that it's not the same cost to align this U to that position. Uh, well, if you have only seen the sequence, you would use the score with you align U to S there. But if you have another S over here that has actually an S in this sequence, but it has one on, uh, alignment there, it's not going to be the same score. So every position in your sequence, in your, in your data sequence, has a specific score matrix. So that's why it's called PSSM. So the word profile of PSSM are both used to mean basically the same thing. It's not even clear exactly what I think. I think sometimes you could. Call just the matrix if the profile also contains structure information. And this HBM, so hidden marker models, is a better computational description of the same, the same type of information. So basically, our profiles are the same thing, but they don't have gap information, things like that. So that, that, that's a bit of this, can be to have different discussions. But the thing is that if you have this thing, you can use exactly the same arguments, you use the same argument for these numbers, you start to see exactly the same substitution scores, exactly the same gap penalties, exactly the same arguments. And if you want to get this, you get better alignment, better detection, etc. So basically, you do something like this. Now, if you turn it, I turn it around here, so you have a sequence here, and you have a scoring matrix here. So in this one, you get a score for this position and this one, you get a score for this position. So one of the first methods also 30 years old. So it was from Kids, Comax, Akron, and Eisenberg. And basically, what they got there was, was what they uh, uh, It's basically what you do is, as I said before, so you basically want to calculate the score here. It's exactly as we said in the class of W. So you want to calculate the score for residue, or residue of type A, in column, column 1 there. You basically take just the average, or you take uh, like this one to n amino acid sequences. Amino acids. So in this case, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, D, 1, F, 1, I. So basically the score is the score of substitution A to B, type 5, 7, A to F. Times one seventh and a to i times one seventh. 
in this uh, loss matrix or time that we use. So we have, there are five variables that we use, five types of variables. Okay. Um, before we Make the profile of those the one that you did, which is related to the, uh, the one that you have. Um, so, so somehow you made this one before using some algorithm, but uh, that's for the proof of search, it doesn't happen. Like, but, so you might use some W to build this or something like that. We, but it, we come back to side of it. But in, right now, we assume that it's before they this. Yeah, let me get the question again. So how do you get those to a list? This one. Well, one way would be to uh, maybe we use this blocks matrix or I mean we would today we do side loss on that we can work on later. So you just you would search use of search how you to do it. But in Durham and the event they developed the method, there was something that someone made it made you take the secret gives you write as W or something or something. So there was some, something you already have. That was the, sort of the function. Okay. So this is just how you score it. So th th that's uh, so basically, yeah, it was a not description of the same thing. So one problem with this is that you actually, uh, is that if you look here, you will probably want to have positions that are very random, like this one. You probably don't want to have, I mean, you want to have high weight on the variables here because they're conserved, they're important, I don't know, conserved, but the ones that are not more variable, but they have low weight. You can actually, you could count the information content of every position and, and, and have a better statistical model. And that is what other methods are probably do, and they perform probably slightly better. But, then, but the idea, the simple method is really this, you just take the constitutions and calculate them. But, when, but in this case, we like to, and this element here would be appear to be more conserved than this one here because it happens with element. But it's actually just because there are gaps in other positions, and that's probably not what you want to do. So you, you, can, you can take that, suppose you can have five by one seven for one of those, and just one three. So, I mean, how to obtain this is the side that it's developed in the 90s. And it really was the first really quite automatic algorithm to calculate and uh, 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 to calculate uh, uh, automatic message obtaining profiles and use them. So in, 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 sh in short, what it does, let me get this kind here. So you take your sequence and you run blast, and we discuss last Friday. So what, what, what was good with blast? Do you remember there were two things? It was it new statistics. Sorry. You know, good evaluating when the results were correct or not, or when I mean, a good estimate of the probability to be correct. Another thing is, it, is that it, it was quite fast, so you can run it. So using these two things, you can actually do an iteration. So you take your take your input sequences, search your database, do standard loss, exactly as you, you did uh, on uh, Friday, we discussed, and because you have a good Fresh estimate of statistics, you can say, let's keep all the sequences that have less than 100,000 to be wrong. So there are 99.9% .9 chance to be correct. And we do multi sequence alignment. So actually, in this case, I say we only basically add the sequence to the query other sequence. We don't really put any gaps in. We keep the same sequence the same, but add all the information and obtain such a multi sequence alignment. Okay. And then we make one of these position specific score matrices. We basically make a matrix that has a position of one, you get a minus three by having an argument in the position two, you get a of minus three by position, position three, you get minus four, etc. So you have a scoring position for every position there. 
And then, you can use this link, this PSSL, to search this database again. Get it? And actually, it is the same algorithm, the same tricks. The only difference is that you do to subtract metric variable that is the same as this one that uses PSM that is different everything in your query system. But we use the same tweets with the heuristic search algorithm, we use the same thing, we use the same scores, whatever, it's all the same. That this, instead of having one thing to do, but you have a PSM enabled. And then you can keep on doing this, and because this has more information, you will find some new sequence and we have five additional ones. And you fit together with the same statistics and do another alignment. We keep on doing it until you either don't find any new sequences or you decide you don't want to do it more times. So there is a DM on the web and there's also in the lab. You will actually do this and see if you find more sequences and you can do. So it's quite it's not only that you get better sequences, you actually get better alignments also. You highlight it with on the partners or so on. So, of course, early maps could have done this also, but really, without this fast searching here and these good, good statistics, they would not have worked very well. Because you would have had, I mean, you, yeah, there were some methods that did things like that, but they were, easy, they were quite slow because they, you, couldn't do, you couldn't really run them in a really long time, and they used some heuristic ideas and statistics that were not all good either. So Cybus was kind of a revolutionary method in this way. So, well, it's 45 depends on the mean, but, but basically it, it's significant that even running several iterations there is significant and faster than running uh, speed watermark on everything. So you, you probably, and often you, don't, you often rarely run more than five or ten iterations because it doesn't really and in this case, after you get okay, you will have a positive otherwise. But even as fast, it's significantly better than than using one around the same water bottle. All you use is your risk algorithm, but by using these profiles, you get much better hits. More, you can find more remote homologs, and actually the alignments for the ones you find that are the same are better. And you still keep this good EVA estimate. You might not find out some alignments because it's very low cut in front of you. You're missing the ends because our conservation is often less than the ends. But it, so uh, there might be cases where you do better things. There are, nowadays there are better methods, but it probably took almost 20 years to develop significant better methods. So what is important here is that because it's cut off here, so if you use the even cut off that's too high, you're going to risk we have false positives and they can. As soon as you get some false positives in your database, they might actually take over and you only see them. So that, that can happen. So that it seems like that's why you don't want to run too many iterations because you might want to use this look of So that it's the smallest you do that. So you all get side as well? More or less? You will find it in the web. And I will run the game. The, 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 the DM on the web that is in the lab. So I don't think it's that you could run the game. The other concept that is important is, is, is what's called hidden model models. And that hidden model models is, is actually a machine learning method that is, has been used a lot in bioinformatics for many different concepts. So you will hear more about it when you talk about memory process later by Gunnar. But uh, I think so, at least I think so. Uh, and, but, but it was actually developed for speech recognition. So it was a method that was developed for speech recognition. But it has uh, some nice features. In particular, it can describe the global, global properties of the whole data set into one model. So, it is, not, it is quite good to know this, but to understand it, you need to know what a Markov chain is. So, anybody knows what a Markov chain is? You don't. 
So what is the model change? Well, uh, the probability is totally dependent on the last variable rather than the whole. Exactly. So it's a model process basically that from problem dynamics or has some dynamics of more particles. Basically, you, you, you depend on, it's going to depend on where you are and how you got there. So the classical example, one of the classical examples is basically that type in this case, you want to predict the weather tomorrow. You want to know this kind of weather today, and, and you already know, what well, you want to predict the weather today, but you know the weather of yesterday. So basically you have three states, you have sunny, rainy, or cloudy. That's a short description of the weather. And you have observations about the weather yesterday, but today you collect that. And then you, you can basically say, how likely is it that it was sunny yesterday and it's cloudy today? We know that if you're in California, you probably it's like 9 cents stay here all the time and then something happens. Rather. If you're Sweden, you jump between them all the time. But it is wherever it was made. It says it was sunny yesterday, you have 50% chance of the sun today again. But it's 25% to be cloudy, 25% to be rainy. It was cloudy yesterday, you have 37% chance to be sunny and 37% chance to be rainy. So it's very unlikely to stay cloudy two days in a row. It really was up or it was pushed down. On the other hand, if it's rainy, it's 52% chance to be cloudy tomorrow. And 37% to be more rainy. And then only 12% chance to be good from sunny. So this is you get character to have observations. This is a you can basically generate a model. In principle, you can then with this model, you say, okay, I know it's sunny today. What is, how likely is it, is it that it's sunny next Friday? You can just calculate that because you know, okay, I, I can go here for sunny, 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 sunny all the way. I can go, I can go I mean, how likely is it to be sunny seven days in a row? It's 0.5 to the power of seven. But if you want to all possible possibilities sunny next Friday, you have to go through all the possible ways to become sunny seven days. Okay. And of course, after a while, you're going to have, you're going to have a stability, you're going to have no information what you have today, it's going to be an equal equilibrium, it's going to be whatever, if it's equal, probably to be all states, whatever it is. So you have, you have an initial distribution there. So, so this is a marker chain, it's not a hidden marker chain, it's a marker chain, or a marker model. The difference is with a hidden marker model is that you add one layer of hidden layers. So actually, in this case, you assume you don't know the weather, but you want to figure out. But you can only observe something else, like soggy, damp, dry to dry. You want to have something that can match with the dryness, you don't have any uh, camera. So it can be soggy, damp, and dry. And so for these for this observations, maybe you want to figure out what is the weather today, or what is the weather tomorrow, or you want to be able to predict something like that. So for that, you need to know what is the probability that it, it is sunny that I observe soggy, etc. So, in a sequence word, uh, this could be a sequence, and this could be for instance, a helix sheet in the, in the loop. What is the probability that I observe a helix sheet loop if I have a sequence? What is the probability that I have? Uh, have a sequence that, 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 that generates these observations of here this machine. And so you can have observations of something like this. So you may, oh, you may, you may have a seaweed that we didn't know, you were to do what happens to seaweed. And you see that if it's, if it's very sunny, you can measure the fixed percent chance that the seaweed is dry, etc. And then you can do the same thing, you can actually calculate all these probabilities and all these observation matrices. And uh, if you have enough data, you can calculate it. And you can actually generate, generate this whole model, and you can actually even do some predictions, like so what is the prediction that if it's soggy today, that, it dry, that, it's, that the sea will dry tomorrow? By implementing this. And you can actually use sort of dynamic programming algorithms to figure this out, or you can train the model, the learner to give it a lot of data. So this, this was, my initial set was for speech recognition, but in the proof of work has been also done on the sequences. 
we can actually describe an alignment of two sequences, or an alignment of a sequence for multiple sequence alignments more commonly, by some embodied of those right there, more or less. So, a match state, that means that in alignment work, you have to, as we also have an alignment, you have two sequences aligned. So, if you want to align something with this one here, you have a match state, that means you align there. You have a uh, in some states, it means that you have to go up here, so maybe you have an extra L here, and then you have maybe another mass state, and then maybe you have a gap state or delete state, so there's a couple of extra long, and then you have another mass state. So that means that if you have an the sequence, the profile, or the hidden mark model, it, it is described by this formula. So you can go from here to the uh, insert state, to another mass state, so the delete state is turn around here for a while, and then you uh, jump to another match state for a third of And each of these states here, um, this is a very delete state, emits a sequence. So here the lake is the sequence that's generated. So to make one of these models, I can say, what is the likelihood that this model generates this sequence here? Or, if I have the sequence, what is the best path to this model? So this I can do with general programming. And I can train this, if I have a multiple sequence alignment, I can train this, train this all the probability. I have to do some estimates, but it's simple to do it. So, this, so basically you can describe the same information as I have in profile. So we have... I can basically train this uh, hidden marker model. So I can estimate all these emission probabilities and all uh, the emission probabilities of the other sequences and also all these transition probabilities by giving a lot of examples. So maybe I give an example of a, of a, of a, of a of family and then I calculate all these probabilities and train it to become better and then I can use this later to find more sequences in the family. So it, it, it's very similar idea as a, as a profile but you have very you can have every single gap penalty so it's up here can be the, Individual adjustment is optimized in a train of it. So it's uh, a more, much more efficient way of searching for uh, uh, even, even more remote models. So it's, it's used, I mean, initially uh, the methods that were developed were quite slow. So uh, you, you can have a database which took many, many hours, but there is a particular method called Hammer 3. That is, has used the sum of the tricks from Blast, the other tricks also, to make it quite fast. So it's not really as fast as Blast is, but it's, um, uh, it's almost as fast, maybe it's as fast as five slow or three slow or something. And it uh, also has something called Jackhammer, which is a program that is actually very much as side blast, it iterates through it, same idea. That is, well, Slightly slower than last, but uh, much more sensitive. You find them find many more homeworks. Get better lines. There's an alternative method that's a bit more a bit more complicated computationally, but it's similar performance for edge speeds. But it, so this method it probably took more than ten years for them to really replace side loss and lost some that was clearly better. But now well, they, they clearly have advantages for those side loss. And uh, I mean, this hidden model concept has been used in many other cases. I mean, one good thing is that you can do things like that. If you want to have a dis distribution of distances that looks like either the blue one or the red one, you can do it by modeling, changing this, this hidden model model, you can actually model and change it around and make it. Uh, more or less fit in the probability distribution you want to have.
Okay. So the last part I was going to mention in the search is actually is something that I think I'll talk about more later. It's this proof on proof alignment. Basically, what you can do is you have to take the whole concept one, one step even further. So instead of aligning a sequence to a proof one or a sequence to an HMM, you can actually align two proof ones to each other. And you can do the same thing. You can basically just use the same scoring function here. You basically take a fraction of each amino acid in each of these two columns and you add them to, together. And do this on social matrix. So instead of doing it, so you basically take two proof files and take that position, that position, and also do the score for these two to be aligned. You might need to adjust gap at this, but you basically use the same ideas here as you do when you do sequence proof alignment or sequence sequence alignment. Well, not so sure, they this are actually better. Old paper, yeah. Okay, so that was a quick run through all the slides. Any questions on that? A progressive multiple sequence alignment. When you do parallel alignment, do you do it for every possible sequence piece? Or some other things that don't have to the parallel alignment or the sequence are similar. Uh, well, a general problem in these multiple sequence alignment circuits are that um, they are often not very good at things that are not too similar. So if you start having too many gaps, the gap, as I said, the gaps are a problem. If you start having too many gaps, you could sort of easily end up with something that's quite bad. So this formally with I mean, doesn't do anything, but it, it, it's if you put in a lot of sequences that are not that are related but but very distantly related, you're gonna have a difficult way to make good alignments. So you really need to start you know, with, the, with the most uh, uh, I did have some sequences that are more similar to each other, so you get a good alignment to start from. Uh, I don't know, and this A and B was, I guess, was the amino acids in this position of it. So I think we went through the scores. Basically, the score is just a sum. We can think about it. It's just, it's just a sum of all substitutions. That's normally the score. And there are other methods, but it's generally not score. Uh, the problem with the average profile is really that it's. Uh, uh, that it is uh, not uh, taking into account conservation. So really, as I said, if you have complete conserved positions, you should have a higher weight than, than if it's just uh, one uh, sequence could align the gap of the rest of the positions. So the conservation, someone should focus on that. And there are some methods that do that, they weigh things together, but they are I'm not sure they are so much better, but they probably are. And the, the, the thing that really works best is actually to use uh, uh, the heat of other models. If you, if you want to train an HMM, the training of this proper HMM is actually quite complicated. It's very much ad hoc. Also, you just need to start with something. You have to start with a multi sequence alignment. And for that, you can actually calculate the. Uh, You, you make a rough estimate of the all these matches. So you make exactly you do the proof of exactly how many alleles you find in position. So then, then you set some rules so you have a, 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 a mission for it that is high value so and low value I mean, as if it's more M analysis there. But then also you have to take all the sequence in your area line, so in your lines against the same sequence again, and then you adjust all the weights and the transitions and emissions to be better at recognizing the sequence that you feed to it. So, the, so you have a process of training the HMM. So you are trying to change it, and the dark exactly how that is done is uh, it's quite complicated, and I'm not sure I know the details. But basically, you try to adjust the weights by minimizing some error function. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, HMM is uh, special case for so the yeah, yeah, so yeah. You can use the same method. You can use the same method, use bound by actually. Yeah. But, but the, they have a particular first step here. Yeah. I don't know what Hammer does in Hammer 3, but in Hammer 1, they use a lot of ad hoc things that you need to use that you have kind of special protein. And, and, I mean, I know it's probably that you need it hard to describe the substitution matrix. So if you have a few sequences, I mean, you have a very big family for you, you probably listen to the other scars. And in a few sequences, you want to have something like some social matrix and how that you know that that's from experience that's important. So you have a prior distribution that you try to put in there. So, so there are a number of tricks to make it better work in a special case. But in principle, you use the same method as, uh, as you do. I'm not saying the HMM, but yeah, this, this are the sequences that are, they have some special tricks to be up to. And I mean, Mainly because you have limited amount of data, you have a lot of data. So, I don't know what I mentioned here, that's okay, but uh, my, my, I, my, I think that. I mean, so there are, we, the the model models have been used in several different aspects, and quite a lot of them. For instance, there are good models for finding, uh, uh, if you want to predict the gene from the genome, so it's identified the, the coding region, I don't know, well, it, it all is good enough. You, I think most methods use uh, uh, and in the model model today, so really that's a very good way of describing the whole genome. We use it for topology predictions in the memory process, that's also a very common thing. So you want to describe the whole whole sequence of once, you want to do. It hasn't really been used that successfully for secondary structure prediction. You can imagine you can have a secondary structure prediction, you want to predict a helix to be a sheet, and then you should not overlap with all each other. So, so, so those. I know there is a lot of trials, but I do the best methods that are around. That I know about are not using it because it hasn't been really that successful, I guess. Uh, and but, but so, so, so there are particular, some particular fields where it's been used. And nowadays, I, I could imagine that some of the more advanced deep learning methods are used for image recognition so on could be used and replaced in the model models. So they have been very successful in other fields, but they. I don't think they have any good examples of it yet, I think I know what uh, I could imagine it will happen. Okay, any other questions you want to discuss? Something that I'm clear? So how, the, 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 which, which lab did you have last Friday? Did you have the, the last lab? Or? I don't really remember. I guess I have a scan there. Python lab. Python lab. Python lab. Today you have alignment of loss. Okay, so the first alignment lab is now. Okay. Yeah. So there was the Python string operations and so on. So, I went to, so, so far you will have one byte matrix lab. The genes and the genomes, you must have databases. Yeah. So, I, I guess the, the last Python lab is on uh, Wednesday. Friday. Well, maybe, no, maybe on Friday. Yeah, Friday also. Yeah, 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 it's one on. Yes, it's one on Wednesday, one on Friday. Or Wednesday, Thursday, something like that on Friday. Just to Wednesday. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we've been told that uh, Python will be used in future labs. Uh, which labs are we talking about? Uh, maybe in the next course. Next course? Yeah. Now, why do we learn Python now? Because it's useful. 
Uh, this schedule is not, but it, it's much less, I mean, I don't want to talk about anything else, but the schedule is not less. So, but it, but it's, it's really much fewer lectures. They just, they make the projects. And I think I try to organize this for you, uh, like some activities every Thursday, Friday, something, but I have to find a place to be first. What is the next course called? It's called like a project in molecular life science or something. So it's not a course that I would take. That's uh, possible. Mm -hmm. so, they, they for the biochemistry, biophysics masters, I think most people take the membrane something course or something. I am uh, reading individual course. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, if you haven't applied for it, you're not taking it. But there's another. The, the, the biochemistry masters have a course in the membrane photos, I think. And uh, the biophysics masters can choose between these two courses. The side of the boss have to take a body course. So, uh, there was a few people that did both membrane this course last year. Yeah. If you if you know programming, that's possible. Otherwise, it's quite tough. I think that uh, the membrane course is not a good individual course. Yeah. That's quite likely. I mean, the, the, the I mean, there the, are these two options basically. I mean, the manager is good, but it's uh, a good thing in taking the. I think, particularly, there are two more courses in the end of the semester. Like one is called physical chemistry, something, yeah. Yeah. and one is called uh, comparative economics. Yeah. And particularly, the comparative economics course, with this, this project course is really good. So that, uh, I think there are quite a lot of assignments there where you need to do some programming. Physical chemistry, I, there might be some, but less, I think. But it's, that's <laughs> yeah, a formal of things and requirements. Compared to economics, there are, I mean, there are practical hands on assignments and you need to do some programming. Yeah. That is, that might, at least it was like a last year, it's not my course, so they might be changed, but I don't think so. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh,